Good morning, everyone. My name is Grant Glover, and I am the interim high school minister and college director at PCBC. We're going to continue on our series uh, on the book of Galatians this morning. And the whole theme of this series has been about finding freedom in Christ. And today, specifically, we're going to talk about finding freedom from religion and taking slightly a different angle and look at that. And I want to start off this morning by painting a picture of what God, what Paul is going to say in this passage and the light he's going to paint it in. And so if you couldn't tell, I am a golfer. If it wasn't the looks that gave it away or the years spent working on my dad bod, I am indeed a golfer. I spent my whole life playing the game and am borderline obsessed with it and am somewhat of an addict. And my mom, when I was younger in high school, used to drop me off at the golf course every summer early in the morning, like eight or nine. And I would stay there and practice and play and mess around all day. She'd come pick me up later in the afternoon. After a whole day of practicing, I took countless lessons, played countless times, played in tons of tournaments. And after all those years of playing golf, Do you want to know the one thing that I have learned about it? Practicing does not automatically make you better. I still stink at golf. No matter how much work I put in, trust me, for a head case like me, it does not matter how much I practice. I could either go out and play really good or really bad. This afternoon, I have a tea time with my family, and I am playing a match against my dad and younger brother. And who knows what's going to happen. I can't stand the thought of losing to my little brother, but we'll see what happens. But everyone in the room is trying to get better at golf because the sad reality is most people just aren't very good at it. It's a fact of life. I'm sorry. And it's a hard game. And many men in this room have spent thousands of dollars on lessons and buying new clubs. And to the latter, which buying new clubs in no way, shape, or form helps your golf game. I promise you are better served on going on eBay and getting a cheap set of clubs. And I really apologize for giving all the wives in this room ammo. That's my bad, it's just truth. I just can't call it any other way. And the same thing, the same principle goes for professional golfers. Like, do you think the answer to the guys who are struggling on tour right now is to practice harder? I mean, these guys have a whole team of people around them. They have a nutritionist, a mental coach, a swing coach, a life coach, whatever. And they are working every day to try to make a paycheck because if they do not make the cut, they will not get paid. And they are spending hours upon hours practicing. And do you think that just telling them to try a little harder would make them better at golf? It's not that simple. And it really is not that simple in any sport. And what's interesting is while most people would agree that simple effort is not quite enough to perfect a sport or to be good at it, and though effort is certainly a part of the picture, it has to be present, there's more to it than that. There's more to golf and sports and crafts like that than simple effort. And while we recognize that about things like golf, it's a much more difficult concept to wrap our minds around in like our personal lives. So most people in here, for example, would like to become a better person, ideally, that in some way, shape, or form to become better than you are now. And many have tried by sheer effort and feel that after a lot of years and a lot of time that nothing is really happening. And so perhaps you are starting to get to a point where you are feeling like you are giving up. Or perhaps you've made a lot of mistakes that you try really hard to make up for them, that you try to overcome them through sheer effort, and then you fall right back into your old ways and you wonder, is it possible for me to do anything different? Or maybe you're scared of becoming a Pharisee, a legalist, that if you try too hard to indoctrinate yourself into church culture, that you will take on things that you don't like and you will become legalistic and rule-bound and become prideful. 
And so while everyone wants to become a better person, we all want to know how to grow, but we want to know how to grow without feeling like our efforts are wasted or that we're cycling back and forth and always trying to make up for past mistakes and not become a rule-following legalist like the people that we don't like. And so the question simply today that this passage will address is, how do you grow without feeling like your time is wasted or feeling like a failure or getting wrapped up in legalism? We're going to find the answer in Galatians 3, verses 1 through 9. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there. Galatians 3, 1 through 9. And in this passage, Paul is going to lay out the three phases of growth. What we're going to see today is where you start, where you progress, and where you finish. Paul's going to take us through the passage. We're going to see all three of those phases. And so first, to understand how to grow, you have to know where even to begin, where to start. And what he's going to set up in this idea of starting is the tension that will kind of encapsulate the rest of the passage. And so if you'll look down with me at verse 1, Galatians 3, 1, Paul starts off with, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? So here's a massive call out. He's calling them out for where they're living. And without diving too deep into the context, because we've done that a lot in this series, the Galatians were struggling with racial and ethnic unity because they were starting to force Gentile or Greek Christians to adopt Jewish practices to become a full Christian and fully acceptable to God. So what he's doing is he's calling them out for behavioral practices. And what does he do? Normally what we would expect is for him to give them a list of rules, commands to follow, Or maybe he would give them a book, Paul's Five Steps to Stop Behaving Like a Legalist. But he does none of that. Instead, look at the rest of verse 1. Here's where he starts. It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. He goes backwards. Back to things they already know. And talking about their behavior, he calls them to the crucifixion of Jesus. The question is why? Not only that, why does he say that it was before their very eyes that he was crucified when the Christians he's writing to in Galatians certainly weren't present on the day when Jesus was crucified? It's because the reason for all of these things is the Greek word for publicly portrayed is pographo. And it means a kind of public announcement. It could be used to mean some kind of placard or sign that was held up. And what he's saying is that when Paul originally came to them, came to the churches in Galatia, he so vivid, vividly and graphically described what happened on the cross. And it wasn't just an intellectual thing they believed. It was something that sunk down into their hearts. He's saying that I, Paul, painted a picture of what Jesus did for you and what the contents of what I said and the picture I displayed so moved you that you began to live in a different way way. And so what he's essentially saying is that the beginning of growth, the beginning of stepping out of this legalism they were trapped in, is being moved by the cross. And the question is, what good does that do? Because that seems a little counterintuitive. We'll look down at verse 6, where he gives an example of someone who has been moved by what God has done. Galatians 3, 6. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now he's using Abraham as an example, and it wasn't that Abraham had actually himself seen Jesus be crucified, but he's an Old Testament example of someone who understood how God works and operates in relationships. Because the key phrase here in verse 6 is credited as righteous. And it's at the very core of the gospel. And I'll show you how Jesus being crucified and being credited with righteousness is really what frames this whole passage. And if those of you, for those of you who don't know, I was a finance major in college. 
And clearly that degree is really paying off for me. I love all the models I get to run around church. It's great. All the Excel spreadsheets I'm in. As a finance major, though, I had to take three semesters of the worst possible classes anybody can take. It is the stuff of nightmares. And it was accounting. I had to take three semesters of that stuff. And it was, I was so miserable in all those classes that it literally made me want to smack my head on those two textbooks that were way too big and the most boring things I have ever read. And look, for my accountant friends out there, all 10 of you, this is about to be your time to shine. Because you don't have to tell us your jobs are miserable. We already know that. My classes were awful. But today is your day. Because today... There's at least one good thing that came out of all of my accounting classes, all those hours I spent being miserable, and that's that the Greek word here for credited is an accounting term. So this is the one-time accountants where your job is relevant at work. Congratulations. At church, here's an accounting sermon illustration, one time and one time only. To be credited as righteous or to be credited with righteousness essentially means this, that by dying on the cross, Jesus took on our debt, our flaws, our failures, our mistakes. Think about your personal account, the debts you owe, mortgages, loans, things like that. He actually takes those from you, removes those debts from you, but not only that, He doesn't only just pay off the debt and take on those notes as his own. He also credits cash, deposits his cash into your account. That's what this term is bringing up, and its meaning is simply this. That in your life, he takes on your bad performance of record, your bad record of living, and gives you a good record instead, without you having to work for it. So rather than your flaws and failures and mistakes counting against you, he takes those on himself and instead gives you a status as someone who is innocent and perfectly righteous even though you are not. That is the core meaning of what Paul is getting at. And this then is where to start. Christ's payment for your righteousness. This is where you start with growth. And the reason is, is because this is what makes the gospel different from normal religion. And why Paul has to continuously hammer this home in the book of Galatians. And why it can often sound repetitive because it's what we need to hear. Because religion and everything we're surrounded by in culture tells you to work harder. And that if you do certain things, you can please God and be righteous. Every religion operates in some sense of rules or things to do to get God's approval. But the gospel says God has already made you righteous, even though you've done nothing to deserve it. All religions, all other religions tell you that the place to grow, where you start, is getting your act together. To begin to turn from your old life. Do good deeds. Read things more. Do all these practices. Not that they're bad, but the gospel does not say that's where you start. You simply acknowledge the place to start is actually the opposite to admit you're not good enough. You don't have the record that you need to please God. And you simply acknowledge that God has already said you are righteous and wonderful in my eyes. And that is not changing. And it's all based on the work of another person. And the reason we have to keep preaching this is because that makes no darn sense. That somebody else's work actually counts for ours and we're seen as perfect. That makes no sense. And this is healing because it's the validation we all need. If you have a religion of works, a religion in which you are striving to please God, which the Galatians were slipping into because they were telling people that, hey, believe in Jesus, but then become Jewish and follow these customs, and then God will really be happy with you. And the thing is, if you have that kind of religion, you are always working to please God, and you have a subliminal fear that he's disappointed with you, and that your efforts just aren't quite enough. Or, if you don't find your identity, your sense of self, 
in God declaring you to be righteousness, you will always find yourself working to please other people to get a sense of being righteous or validated. You want to make a certain income to impress those in this city. You want your kids to live a certain way so that you could be seen as a good and successful parent. And generally speaking, you want people to like you, which is why you will chameleon your way around any social event or setting that you're in, be it church or elsewhere. We all are seeking validation, but the gospel comes in and God says, this is why we have to start here because he says, I validate you. I call you righteous and no matter what you do, my mind is not changing. It's the opposite of the way the world works. And some of you can hear that and ask, well then, what is the point of living rightly if that's true? If it's true that God looks at me like that, if I'm already righteous in his eyes, why change how I live? Because what's the point? It sounds like I could be preaching cheap grace and I could just say, hey, pray this prayer, be innocent, and live however you want. But that is not at the core or the heart of the Christian faith. And I'll explain how this principle of accepting God's validation on your behalf actually leads to growth. And that will be our second point. We've talked about where you start. Now let's talk about where you progress, which comes from where you start. So after pointing the Galatians back to the cross in order to address their behavior, look at how he follows it up with addressing this. Verse 2. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? He asks a rhetorical question. Did the Galatians receive the Holy Spirit by doing good works or believing in the gospel? And because he's mentioned it so much, the obvious answer is... By believing the gospel, not by works. And so notice what's going on here, that receiving the Holy Spirit does not require some weird type of meditation or some weird type of cultivating spirituality or the laying on of hands, but simply trusting that Jesus' record on our behalf is enough for, us to, for God to call us righteous. Now, some people oftentimes are not aware of the Holy Spirit's actual function in the Christian life, and it becomes clearer in verse 3, where Paul goes on to say, Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Let me translate. He's saying that the Galatians begun in their faith by the Spirit, and now they are trying to advance in their faith by their own effort. And this is where the Galatians and many people have a misconception about the Holy Spirit because we often think that the Holy Spirit's only job is to produce power in us, to convict us, to fight sin, become more spiritual. And he does do all of those things, but that is not his primary role. No, the Bible says there's something different and more fundamental to what his job is in our lives. And Jesus himself says it in John 16, 13 through 14. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Here's what Jesus is saying. The Holy Spirit is not meant to add to your status. It's not meant to add to your justification. Is not meant to add to you being declared righteous before God. But to teach you about who Jesus is and what he did over and over and over again because we are prone to forget and find our validation in other places. And Paul backs this up in Romans 8, 16. He says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. His fundamental identity, his fundamental job, is to remind you of your identity, to remind you that you have been pardoned and forgiven and that you are loved by God no matter what. And if that is true, then Paul is saying that if you begun, if you began by having the Spirit convince you of Christ's work on your behalf, and now you're trying to add to it with your own effort, that's not going to work because that's, that's not how the Spirit works. The radical truth of Christianity is that you advance in the faith 
the same way you started with the gospel. This is where you progress. You go back to the gospel, your justification, your declared righteous status over and over again. Because this is what Paul is saying about how Christianity works. It's not about praying a prayer, taking an altar call, and then applying biblical principles and trying really harder to reshape your life. No, what he's saying is you let the truth of the gospel sink in deeper and deeper into your core. And that is actually where the growth comes in. And what it means is that the gospel must be preached, like Paul is doing to the Galatians, on a daily basis if you really want to see change in your life. And the question is, how can this be? And the thing is, is this is the distinguishing factor between the gospel and normal religion and our normal operating modes of living. Because all other religions and the way we normally operate is by some sort of moralism that you have to do certain things in order to please God. And some of you think that you feel far from him or that he's not pleased with you right now. And most of the time, what culture teaches, especially Christian or religious culture, is that abstaining from certain things, certain sins, like sex or alcohol, or doing certain things, like reading your holy text or praying or giving to the poor, those are the things that will make God finally not be frustrated with you. But what you have to realize is that the world's three largest religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, share about 70% of their moral code. Think about that. They all kind of teach something very similar, at least in the majority sense, that there's no sex outside marriage, don't get drunk, dress conservatively, pray every morning, and a lot of other things, about 70%, not all, there's distinguishing factors, but a lot of their morals are the same. And what Paul is saying is that what makes Christianity distinct is not fundamentally the morals. What makes Christianity distinct and what makes Christian growth distinct is the reason behind them. The fundamental identity shaping that the gospel provides. And... Many people around church throw around the term sanctification, and that essentially means growing, becoming more like God, being conformed to look more like Jesus, day by day, after you become a Christian. But modern popular evangelicalism has misunderstood how salvation occurs. It does not simply, or how sanctification occurs. Sanctification does not occur primarily through outward efforts or external actions, though they help, but there's something more meaningful and something more significant about growth as a Christian than simple external efforts. And Dane Ortland puts it this way. He says, the process of sanctification or growth is in large part fed by constant returning even more deeply to the event of justification or being validated by God. Let me explain that. What he's saying, here's what he's explaining in his book called Deeper. Justification, he says, is outside in. Sanctification is inside out. And inside out sanctification is fed by daily appropriation of outside in justification. I know, he's smart. Let me break it down. A little over my head too. What he says is that justification, which I explained in the first point, which is this idea that you've been declared righteous, is essentially where God gives a righteous status to you as a son or daughter that you don't deserve. And what that does is melt your heart. You're pardoned for things that you shouldn't be pardoned for and treated unlike you deserve by a gracious God. It's outside righteousness onto you. Nothing you've done. Sanctification or growth, on the other hand, is inside out. Where external actions... Things you do don't drive it, but the changed heart, the melted heart from what God has done is a new motivation for the outward behavior. So justification moves outside into us and then sanctification, growth, moves inside out. And if both of those are true, then this is how to grow. The way forward is backwards. That is what makes the gospel the gospel. 
To go back to the gospel over and over and over again is how you progress and is developed by a changed heart through the Holy Spirit reminding you of what God has said and not by your own effort. Like in my opening analogy, sometimes the best things to do in golf is to return to the fundamentals. And the same goes for the heart of Christianity. That's what he's talking about. And Martin Luther puts it this way. He is not righteous, speaking to all of us. Any of us are not righteous who does much, but he who without work believes much in Christ. The law says do this, and it's never done. Grace says believe in this, and everything is already done. Righteousness comes from what has been done on our behalf. And let me explain this principle of growth by applying this status deeply in our lives so you can see it at work. The easiest example I can pull that I think just about everybody in this room can relate to is being mad at some relative. We all have that one aunt, that one grandparent, that one parent, that daughter, the grandson that we are angry with and it consumes much of our thoughts and dinner time conversations. And COVID may have made that worse. And the thing is, is that oftentimes, when we get angry, what Christian culture will tell you to do is, hey, look, Jesus is forgiving, so you be forgiving. Be like him. And it's true, we should be like him, but that's not the motivation for living differently. No, if the gospel is true, if what Paul is saying is true, the, what changes you fundamentally is realizing that you're seeking some validation that you're not going to find there. For example, when you have that one kid who's gone rogue, and who you're upset with, what the gospel says is not simply be like Jesus, but how much of your validation are you putting on that child performing the way you want them to? How much of your identity is wrapped up in how successful your children are? When you're worn out with your kids, the answer is not be patient like Jesus, which is true. It's why am I so angry? Why am I so condescending? Is it because I'm trying to find something in them that I can only find in God? That's the gospel answer. When you feel like your spouse never listens to you and you are angry, the answer is not, well, people didn't listen to Jesus either. That's true, but the gospel to provide the growth, the spiritual power says, you cannot find in your spouse what you can find in what God has done. It allows for a release of freedom. When you have that one family member who never shows up to anything and you're tired of them, the answer always is go back and where is in my fundamental identity, where am I seeking validation that only God can give me? And that's growth. When the truth of what God has done has sunk deep into your heart, when it has sunk deep into your core, when you realize your validation, everything you're looking for in life has already been given to you by what God has said, then you change. And rather than slapping yourself on the wrist, the gospel comes in and says, why are you trying to find your validation sense of self in this person, in that person, in that career or that thing? Don't you know that God, the creator of the universe, has considered you lovely and wonderful already and that's not changing? And this is what it means to walk by the Spirit. This is what it means to allow God's love and validation for you to shine brighter and speak louder than all the other voices in your life. That's growth. Going back over and over again to the gospel. As you understand the gospel better, you grow and begin to live knowing you are validated. God has called you lovely and you don't need to find that anywhere else. The way forward is backward. And when you see this, it'll be easy to see our last point, and I'll wrap up here, and it's where you finish. If it's true that where you start is by simply accepting that Christ's record is enough, and how you progress is going back and letting that seep deep into your heart, then where you finish, Paul explained the result of this kind of growth. Look at verse 7. He says, it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. In other words, to be a part of God's story in the Old and New Testament is not about rule keeping, but believing in the work that has already been done for you. And the result of being a part of this story and accepting God's work on your behalf can be found in verse 8. 
where it says the scripture for seeing God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So notice when God preaches the gospel to Abraham and he preaches this to us, it leads to some type of blessing. And this is what the result of all of this is, where you finish the constant reliance on the gospel to valid, to find your validation in it, leads to the constant reliance of that leads to an all-encompassing blessing. And this is radical when you begin to break it down, because when Paul says blessed here, he's not talking about material blessing or a, a greater sense of status or some type of material thing. That's a Western idea. What he's really talking about is a holistic type of blessing. One where when you realize that you are validated by God, no matter what you do, you have true freedom. That means there is no more performance. No more feeling shame and guilt for you not being good enough. It means no more striving to find happiness in life because God has given you everything you need already. And the big difference here is that many Christians treat God as the divine vending machine in the sky. Where you go up, and if you hit the right combo of buttons, God will spit out what you want. Or you go to culture. And you push in the right combo of buttons everyone else tells you to, and you hope that you get out some, side of hap- some type of happiness or contentment through it. But notice that this type of blessing that Paul's talking about is deeper. It's the declaration that God says you are lovely and wonderful no matter what you do. And if the stock market crashes, and you're terrified of what that means for your 401k, last two quarters of GDP are not looking good. I don't know who read the news this week. If your spouse is treating you poorly, you're threatening to leave, and the trauma is associated with it. If you lose your friends and begin to have this overwhelming fear of being worthless, at the end of the day, you have God's validation and approval. And that's what matters. And it means a life free of being dependent on circumstances. A life beyond circumstances. That this is a true type of holistic, all-encompassing Blessing, And that right there is what every heart in this room, including mine, is desperately desiring. To know that we are okay no matter how we perform, how we fail, or how we don't measure up to the world's standards of achievement. And for those of you who do not, have not believed that and are hearing something like this for the first time, it is very simple to receive this. Very simply just to accept that Christ's record is good enough for you for you to be called lovely and wonderful. For those of you who desire to experience it more now, that is what church is for. If you're wanting to to experience more of this sense of knowing that God loves you no matter what, that's what we would love to do here at PCBC, through community and through everything we do here. And if you know all of this, last thing I'll say, if you know all of this, if you hear all of this all the time, but you still feel you are struggling, God's view of you still is not changing. No matter how far you think you are from him, his view of you is not changing no matter what. And you can have hope that in full, one day the thing that God has said about you, that you are lovely and wonderful, you will actually experience and realize when you stare him face to face. That one day you really will understand that it is all is well. So where you start in the faith is the same way you advance, by applying what God has said of you to every element and aspect of your life so that you can finally be free from trying to perform and appease people and racking yourself with guilt when you fail. The way forward is backward. Let us pray. Father, thank you for today and for your word. Thank you for what you have done, that you have declared us innocent and lovely and wonderful by taking on the penalty we deserve. And let us rest in that to know that our performance doesn't matter, our failures don't matter, what you did matters. Let that sink deep into the core of our being that we might live changed and differently simply because we are able to let go of trying to perform and know that it is all well already. And I pray that those in this room who are struggling, wrestling with doubts and fears and insecurities and are going through a lot, 
would know that you call them lovely and that that would be the anchor and the comfort they need to hear this week. In your name I pray, amen.